Okay, I think we'll, uh, we'll get underway. Uh, in the last few lectures here, uh, some of what we are doing is in what some of you will regard as apocrypha, and some of you will regard as deuterocanonical. So these are books that are in the Catholic Bible and not in the Hebrew Bible, not in the Protestant Bible. I will talk about this in the last lecture of how it was determined what was in and what was not in. Uh, one obvious reason for some of these books was that they were written in Greek. Now, uh, in all we have, um, in the, the Catholic canon, you have the books of Wisdom, Ben Sira, one and two Maccabees, Tobit, Judith, Baruch, and some extra passages in Esther and Daniel. Now, uh, if any of you, Matthew perhaps, uh, have Orthodox Bibles, you get even more for your money, because you also get third and fourth Maccabees. And of course, if you get the Greek Bible, the Septuagint, you will also have other things that aren't in any Western canon, like the Psalms of Solomon and the Odes of Solomon, and an extra psalm. So no, we'll talk about this because there was always a fuzzy edge to the canon. And you know, down really to modern times, uh, there's always some disagreement as to what should be counted as canonical. But for today, I want to talk about the two big wisdom books. These are Ben Sirah and the Wisdom of Solomon. And these are important books uh, also for the New Testament. Because, you see, the last book of the Hebrew Bible is the book of Daniel, which we will talk about uh, on Wednesday and again on Monday. But Daniel was written early in the second century. Pretty much everything else had been written by the third century, but say by the year 200. But now an awful lot went on in Judaism in those 200 years. And what went on in those 200 years was very directly relevant to what you now get in the New Testament, because the New Testament is in fact a product of Second Temple Judaism. Uh, it is this too. It begins as a, as a Jewish sect. But uh, the, these two wisdom books of Ben Sira and the Wisdom of Solomon are big books, fairly important books. The book of Ben Sira was written in Hebrew, uh, and for a, it's the only book that is really debated by the rabbis and the only apocryphal book that is, uh, that is cited by the rabbis. Now, I should say that they debated some books that were finally included, like Kohelet and even the Song of Songs. But um, of the ones that were not included, uh, Ben Sirah is the only one that gets any play in the rabbinic literature. But it didn't survive in full in Hebrew. Some fragments of it, there were quotations in the rabbis. There were some fragments of it found in the Cairo Geniza, at the about 100 years, more than 100 years ago, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, the Cairo Geniza was a place in a, the old Cairo synagogue where they put manuscripts that were out of use. And these were found in an attic with a huge stench around them. It's a great story. Uh, there's a good, very good book about it called Sacred Trash. Uh, but there were fragments of the book of Ben Sirah in it. And uh, now Professor Eric Raymond works on that stuff. Uh, but there are now some of the, those fragments are now at Cambridge University. But now Ben Sira is written early in the second century, but the text, the main full text that we have is in Greek. And this translation was done by his grandson. And we know that because there is a preface or a prologue to the book at the very beginning of the book of Ben Sira. Many great teachings have been given to us through the law and the prophets and the others that follow them. Now that is 
the first reference to something like a canon that we get in the ancient literature. So you have the law and the prophets. Now, whether those categories were already finalized, sealed, so to speak, that's not so clear. Especially in the case of the prophets, in the Greek Bible, Daniel counts as a prophet. In the Hebrew Bible, it doesn't. One possible explanation for that is that the number of Hebrew prophets had already been determined, and that's why Daniel couldn't then be included. But at least by the time of the grandson, it was accepted that you had something called the law. This is what we would call the Torah, the books of Moses, and the prophets, which would include the former prophets that we call the historical books, and uh, at least most of what we now have in the prophets. And then there was a third category. And this is what we call the writings. And at the time of Ben Sira, it is apparent that the writings were still an open-ended category. That's the others that followed them. And it is apparent that uh, Ben Sira, or as the grandson calls him, my grandfather Jesus, great line, who had devoted himself to the reading of the law and the prophets and the other books of the ancestors, was, also, was himself also led to write something pertaining to instruction and wisdom. In other words, Ben Sira, I think, hoped that his book too would count as one of these other writings. And for many people, it did. Now, the book of Ben Sira is a big, sprawling wisdom book. And especially the first half of it is made up of fairly conventional wisdom advice. Uh, I would say compared with the book of Proverbs, there are a lot fewer proverbs in it and a lot more imperatives. And like Proverbs, it's a very cautious kind of book. And it gives a lot of advice on how to deal with various people, such as other people in your family, how to treat slaves, for example. One of the more memorable passages like that is advice about daughters. This is in chapter 42. Um, In chapter 42, verse 9, a daughter is a secret anxiety to her father, and worry over her robs him of sleep. When she's young, for fear that she may not marry, or if marry, for fear that she may be disliked, only the word there really means, I, literally hated, but what it means is divorced. And if she were divorced, where would she go? Well, back to daddy. This is why he's worried about her. And while a virgin, for fear she may be seduced and become pregnant in her father's house, or having a husband, for fear she may go astray, and though married, for fear she may be barren. Keep strict watch over your headstrong, headstrong daughter, or she may make you a laughing stock to your enemies a byword in the city. See that there is no lattice in her room, no spot that overlooks the approaches to the house. Do not let her par parade her beauty before any man or spend her time among married women. And then it concludes with probably the most misogynistic statement anywhere in the Bible. Uh, Better is the wickedness of a man than a woman who does good. Which is really... I mean, that, that is, I'd say, outright misogyny. And that there is at least one other passage that, that is uh, along those lines. You get the impression that he wasn't really happy in his own home life and that he was projecting a certain amount of it. It is not really typical of all the literature of the time. You get a very different view of family relations in the book of Tobit which is a very nice story 
uh, and uh, where there's much more, uh, more affection and concern within the family context, even though uh, Tobit has, uh, the, 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 some of the story concerns a young woman whose husbands keep dying on her wedding night. But we leave that one. But in any case, as I say, a lot of Ben Sira gives you practical advice, a lot of it probably of dubious value. Now, um, I would like, we would like to think that it was because of his misogyny or the like that he wasn't included in the Hebrew canon. Not likely to be the case. I don't think that would have kept him out at all, unfortunately. Uh, probably the reason he was not included in the Hebrew Bible is that it was known who wrote it. And prophecy was thought to have ceased by then. Daniel was included because Daniel was supposed to have lived back at the time of the Babylonian exile. But in the case of Ben Sira, they knew who he was. The most important part of Ben Sira, at least this is probably more from a New Testament point of view, actually, than from a Hebrew Bible point of view, is a long poem on wisdom in chapter 24. Wisdom praises herself. A little bit immodest, shall we say? But you know, this is modeled on the poem in Proverbs chapter 8. It is also quite possibly modeled on hymns uh, attributed to the Egyptian goddess Isis, who also sang her own praises. In the assembly of the Most High, she opens her mouth. Now, this you know, seems to view wisdom as being, for all practical purposes, a goddess. This was also claimed of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8. Uh, not a goddess in the sense that anybody worshipped her, but uh, a personified <laughs> I came forth from the mouth of the Most High. Now, what comes forth from the mouth? Well, it can be, most obviously, I suppose, breath, which can also be spirit, because you have the same word used both in Hebrew and in Greek. And so there is an association here between wisdom and the spirit of God. And that's immediately obvious. I cover the earth like a mist. That's alluding to Genesis, the spirit of God hovering over the water. Also, what comes forth from the mouth are words. And we'll see more directly in the wisdom of Solomon, in the Greek tradition, that wisdom can also be identified with the word, which in Greek is the logos. And this becomes very important background for the Gospel of John, which starts out with the the word personified as a force already in creation. So, wisdom goes on. I dwelt in the highest heaven, and my throne was in a pillar of cloud. Now, who else ever had a throne in a pillar of cloud? You see, only God. And it compassed the vault of heaven, and traversed the depths of the abyss. Now, also, there... These are things that are only said of God in the Hebrew Bible. Over the waves of the sea, over all the earth, over every people and nation I held sway, among all these I sought a resting place in whose territory I should abide. Uh, so wisdom here is, for all practical purposes, the spirit of God, the means by which God is present in the world. Then the creator of all things gave me a command. That the creator chose the place for my tent. He said, make your dwelling in Jacob and in Israel, receive your inheritance. Now, so, whereas uh, in the older wisdom tradition, wisdom, nobody knows where wisdom is. Only God knows where wisdom is. According to Ben Sirah, yes, we do know where wisdom is, 
it is in Israel. And a little bit further down uh, towards the, um, in verse 24, uh, verse 23, he says, all this is the book of the covenant of the Most High, the law that Moses commanded us. Wisdom, in other words, is the Torah. Now, what he meant by that is a matter of some debate. When you read on through the book, you do not find that Ben Sira is expounding verses from the Torah. By and large, he does that once or twice, but most of the time he's just giving you his more or less traditional wisdom. But that it's all supposed to be saying the same thing as the Torah. So I think there is a kind of lifting up of the Torah, a veneration of the Torah, without necessarily reading it in any great detail. I call this an iconic veneration of the Torah. And you will get this a lot in the Second Temple period. You still get iconic veneration of the Bible often by people who have no idea what it actually says and don't even care that much what it actually says. So, but you have this equation of the Torah with wisdom, and it's a new development in Judaism in this period, because in Proverbs and Koheleth, the Torah is not in sight. Traditions of Israel are not in sight. Even though, you know, the final compilers of those books most probably knew the Torah all right. But very little indication and no explicit acknowledgement of it. Here, there is deference to the Torah, but the Torah is the ultimate expression of wisdom. So, um, it, it says in the holy tent, I, in, before the ages, in the beginning, he created me. That's exactly what was said of wisdom in Proverbs 8. And for all ages I shall not cease to be. In the holy tent I ministered before him, so I was established in Zion. So it's also in the temple, it's also identifying the temple cult as a locus of wisdom. So that is one major development in Ben Sira. In that respect, he breaks with older wisdom tradition. In the last part of the book, beginning in chapter 44, then you have the praise of the fathers, where he runs down through all the great figures in the history of Israel and what great people there were. They're held up as examples. It's not really describing the actions or the history as such. It's the examples that these people gave, supposedly. And one of the notable things about the praise of the fathers is that he skips Ezra. He doesn't mention Ezra. And this has been the source of great controversy because some people have been led to wonder, did Ezra really exist or did Ben Sira know about him? There is one other passage in Ben Sira that I want to go through quickly, and this is in chapter 41. And this is his reflection on death. And in this respect, he is old fashioned. Because in the Hellenistic period, early second century, there is a great dividing line, a great change in the religion of. Judaism even. Now, the acceptance of the Torah had come a bit earlier. You get this already in Ben Sira. In chapter 41, O death, how bitter is the thought of you, to one at peace among possessions, who has nothing to worry about and is prosperous in everything, and still vigorous enough to enjoy food. O death, how welcome is your sentence, to one who is needy and failing in strength, worn down by age and anxious about everything, to one who is contrary and has lost all patience. Do not fear death's decree for you. Remember those who went before you and those who will come after. This is the Lord's decree for all flesh. 
Why then should you reject the will of the Most High? Whether life lasts for 10 years or 100 or 1,000, there are no questions asked in Hades. Hades there is the translation of Sheol. Now, this is the standard wisdom of the ancient Near East, the standard view that you get in most of the Old Testament. It will change radically, the changes first really in the book of Daniel and the, the books of Enoch, which came about the same time as the book of Daniel or maybe a little bit before. We saw last day in Koheleth that he was debating, you know, does the spirit of a beast go down and the spirit of a man go up? So that by the third century, you can tell some people were debating that, whether there was a meaningful afterlife for people as opposed to animals. And Koheleth didn't seem to think so. Ben Sira very definitely doesn't think so. From his point of view, this death is the good pleasure of the Lord, that's it. Now we'll get a very different perspective of that in the wisdom of Solomon. Anyone got a question on Ben Sira before we move on? Okay, let's turn over to the Book of Wisdom. In uh, most Bibles, I think you will find it right before Ben Sira, even though it was written somewhat later. And uh, it's the date you know, isn't fully certain. I think the most probable date is around the time of Christ, written in Alexandria. There's pretty good consensus on that written in Greek. One of the, the clues to the date is that it's, it resembles in some ways the thought of Philo, who was a Jewish philosopher in Alexandria, uh, again, around the time of Christ. It's presented as the wisdom of Solomon, the author is writing in the persona of Solomon, but it's obviously not written by Solomon because it's written in rather good Greek and uses a lot of words that weren't even known until um, around the turn of the era somewhere. So uh, he starts out calling on the rulers of the earth and says, wisdom is a kindly spirit. And God is witness to their innermost feelings because in this chapter 1, verse 7, the Spirit of the Lord has filled the world. At least in Catholic liturgies, this is the introit for the Mass on Pentecost. You know, it's kind of a proof text, if you like, of the Spirit. And, and that which holds all things together knows what he said. The wisdom is that which holds all things together. It's, there's some influence here from Stoic philosophy. I think what we call, describe the, the philosophical background of the wisdom of Solomon is Middle Platonism, which was kind of a blend of Stoicism and Platonism. Platonism believed in a higher God. Stoicism believed in an imminent God called the Logos, or the Word, or the Spirit. And this is a spirit within the universe that holds all things together. And wisdom here is cast in that role. It's middle platonic in the sense that it still affirms that there is a God above wisdom. But here it says <coughs> um, that the... But that which holds all things together knows what is said. And therefore, you know, you can't think anything in private. The universe is bugged, so to speak. Uh, the spirit is God listening in on the whole world. That isn't the only thing the spirit does, but it's one of the things that it does. And at the end of that chapter in verse 12, do not invite death by the error of your life, because 
And this, I think, is a remarkable statement. God did not make death. And he does not delight in the death of the living. For he created all things that they might exist. And the generative forces of the world are wholesome. There is no destructive poison in them. For righteousness is immortal. Now, you know, the idea that God did not make death is mind-boggling. It's, uh, you might say, heretical from the perspective of a lot of the, uh, the Hebrew Bible. But I think, um, you see, the, the wisdom of Solomon distinguishes two senses of life and death, I think, because it affirms that the soul is immortal. And uh, for that reason, it can say that God made everything that it should exist. God offers life to everything. And I don't think it meant to say that God meant people to be physically immortal, but that God meant everybody to be spiritually immortal uh, because righteousness is immortal. Now, and so it says, it's the ungodly by their words and deeds who summon death. It goes on then in chapter 2 to say how the unrighteous reasoned unsoundly, saying short and sorrowful is our life. There is no remedy when life comes to an end. No one has been known to return from Hades. Reason is a spark, and when it is extinguished, the body returns to ashes. Our name will be forgotten in time. Now, according to the wisdom of Solomon, people who think that way, who think that there is no meaningful immortality, have then no reason to be good. So in verse 6, they say, Come, therefore, let us enjoy the good things that exist and make use of the creation in full as in youth. Let us take our fill of costly wine and perfumes let us crown ourselves with rosebuds before they wither. Do it. any of you know the poem of William Herrick, Gather ye rosebuds while ye may? Um, so, they, and not only that, but they say, let us oppress the righteous poor man. Let us not spare the widow. Let our might be our law of right, for what is weak proves itself to be useless. I think, actually, this is influenced by Plato's Republic, where there is a debate about the nature of justice. And one of the spokesmen in the Republic, in Book 2 of Plato's Republic, is Thrasymachus, who says that might is right, in effect. That the only law governing what is right and wrong is what you can do. Now, and so this is what's attributed here to the wicked. Of course, in the Republic, Socrates refutes that, and here wisdom will refute it. They say, let us wait, lie in wait for the righteous man because he is inconvenient to us and opposes our actions. He reproaches us for sins against the law and accuses us of sins against our training. Now, uh, I think this uh, implies here that the wicked in question are Jews who are not observant and that it's an inner Jewish debate. He professes to have knowledge of God and he calls himself a child of God. The Greek word there is pais, and it could uh, in principle be translated either child or servant. Uh, in old, more old-fashioned translations, it might often be translated as son of God. Um, he calls himself a child of God, and it becomes clear that that is what is meant here, because a little further down it says that he boasts that God is his father. Let us see if his words are true. Let us test what will happen to the end of his life. If the righteous man is God's, child, he will help him, and he will deliver him from the hand of his adversaries. There is an allusion to that passage 
in the crucifixion scene in the Gospel of Matthew. If he is God's son, let God deliver him. Now, notice here, to be God's son or God's child is to be a righteous person. It's not in this context. Sometimes in the Hebrew Bible, it's a messianic title. It's not messianic here. It's just the righteous person. Thus they reason, says the wisdom of Solomon, but they were led astray, for their wickedness blinded them. And they did not know the secret purposes of God, nor hope for the wages of holiness, nor discern the prize for blameless souls. For God created us for incorruption and made us in the image of his own eternity. The Greek reading there is disputed. There are two forms. It's given in two forms. One of them is the word aidiatetas, which would be his own immortality. And another form misses the first letter of that and has idiotetas, which is in his own form, in the form of his own self. But I think for the wisdom of Solomon, to be in the form of God is to be immortal. But it's the soul, not the body, that's in the image of God. This would also be true for Philo. Now, you see, there's nothing like this really in the Hebrew Bible. But that kind of separation of soul and body, of mind and body, very typical of the Hellenistic world, and it's taken over here. So God created us for incorruption and made us in the image of his own eternity. For through the devil's envy, death entered into the world, and those who belong to his company experience it. There is some debate as to what is meant by the devil here. Most probably, the devil is the figure we would know as Satan. And if so, this is probably the first use of that expression, the first reference to a satanic figure as the devil in Jewish literature. If that is correct, the devil's envy is probably alluding to the story of Adam and Eve and identifying the snake in the garden as the devil. The next place you will find that is the book of Revelation in the New Testament, where the devil is called Ha'afis Ha'archaios, the ancient serpent, the ancient snake. So that's the most probable meaning of it here, I think. Some people think the reference might be to Cain because Cain is the first person to kill somebody. In a way, it's through Cain death enters into the world, and it is because of envy. But I think the Diabolos is more likely to be the figure also known as Satan. But, says the wisdom of Solomon, the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God. Now, notice also he's claiming here that only those who belong to the lot of the devil experience death. Now, it's not that he wasn't aware that people die. But when he says death, what he means is the death of the soul. And that is what those who are of the lot of the devil experience. Now, as I read it, at least in the wisdom of Solomon, you have the prospect of heaven, but you do not have the prospect of hell. What happens to the wicked is that they cease to exist, as they always believed they would. So in other words, they get what they were expecting. They even, you might say they get what they hope for, which is non-existence. And that's the alternative. That's a bit unusual in the literature of the time. Uh, you would not get that in the Semitic language sources. But in chapter 3, then, the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God. This is a very nice passage if you ever have to read a text at a funeral. You know, the, the, uh, no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died. And their departure was thought to be a disaster. And they're going forth from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. Because from the viewpoint of the wisdom of Solomon, 
what matters is the immortality of the soul. Now, this, I think it would be fair to say this became standard Christian doctrine for a long time. In Christianity, typically it's combined with resurrection of the body. There's no resurrection of the body here in the wisdom of Solomon. Here it's just the soul becomes immortal because the soul partakes of wisdom and righteousness and therefore it lives on. In chapter 5, there is a judgment scene uh, very similar to what we will find in the Apocalypses, and I think this book was also influenced by the early Apocalypses. It's a judgment scene at which the wicked are astonished, as they were in the, song, the poem about the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, that when the revelation comes, when the judgment comes, all the wicked or opponents are just astonished because what happens is something that they never expected. Uh, I might mention also at the beginning of chapter four, better than this is childlessness with virtue, for in the memory of virtue is immortality. Now that's a huge change over anything in the Hebrew tradition. In the Hebrew tradition, salvation, you know, the best you can hope for is to see your children and your children's children. And you get immortality through your children. That's how you live on. For the wisdom of Solomon, that doesn't matter. Better to be childless than virtuous because it's in virtue and righteousness that you get immortality. I would underline here how different the logic of this is from what you usually get in the Hebrew Bible. And it's a logic, I think, that had profound influence on Christianity. The idea that the only reason to be good, so to speak, is the prospect of an afterlife and judgment in the afterlife. And that if you take that away, you're undermining morality. Now, for most of the Hebrew Bible, you see, this did not hold. Uh, this is not something that was generally believed. Uh, on the contrary, the general assumption was that uh, nobody had anything to look forward to after death. And so you're supposed to be good just through fear of the Lord. Uh, but reward after death wasn't part of the bargain. It becomes massively a part of the bargain now uh, in the Hellenistic period. And that, of course, becomes quite fundamental to Christianity. There's one other passage I want to discuss with you in the Wisdom of Solomon. And this is in chapter 13. This one also has a parallel in the New Testament in the first chapter of the Epistle to the Romans. All people who were ignorant of God were foolish by nature. And they were unable from the good things that are seen to know the one who exists nor did they recognize the artisan while, be, while paying heed to his works. Now, if people were amazed at their power and working, that is, of the works of God, let them perceive from them how much more powerful is the one who formed them. For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. Now, in the biblical tradition, I think this is probably the first time you get this laid out as an argument. We did have in the Psalms that the heavens show forth the glory of God. And you might infer from that that, um, that, that you can arrive at a knowledge of God from reflecting on nature. But here you get it as an explicit argument. Again, I think this was influenced by the Stoics. 
even though the Stoics didn't believe in a transcendent God, they believed in a, a, you know, a, a divine power in the universe. And the argument given, and this became a classic argument in Christian philosophy later on, is from the order and beauty of the things of nature. The argument is that if you see a beautiful house, you know there must be a builder, there must be an architect. Those things don't just pop up. And here, so you see the beauty and order of creation, and you figure also there must be a creator. This is what we call natural theology. It's theology based on the study of the natural world. Uh, but remarkably here, he says, yet these people are little to be blamed, for perhaps they go astray while seeking God and desiring to find him. And yet again, not even they are to be excused, for if they had power to know so much that they could investigate the world, how did they fail to find Suter, the Lord of all these things? I think the remarkable thing about that passage is that he doesn't just condemn the pagans out of hand. He allows for the possibility that maybe they were trying, maybe they were doing their best. Uh, so he has some sympathy for them. But at the same time, he does hold them accountable. Uh, there's <clears throat> maybe one other point I might mention here. Um, and this is at the end of chapter 11. All of chapters 10 to 19 goes over the whole biblical history without mentioning any names. So it's the righteous man. All the heroes of the biblical story are the righteous man. So the interest is in the typology of it, the kind of person being illustrated. But one of the points that he makes early on is that God is merciful in the way he deals with people, even the way he punishes pe people. Uh, at the end of, of chapter 11, but you are merciful to all, for you can do all things, for you overlook people's sins so that they may repent. For you love all things that exist and hate none of the things that you have made, for you would not have made it if you had hated it. Now, I mean, this is a very positive view of the world, you may say. It's an affirmation of the basic goodness of creation, and therefore that God, uh, God loves it. The good feeling of that verse is damaged a little bit a few verses further down. When in 12.3, we read, Those who lived long ago in your holy land, you hated for their detestable practices. And he has just said, God doesn't hate anyone. But the Canaanites, well, I mean, you got to draw the line somewhere. So I think, you know, there is still a, a strand in this book of Jewish particularism, if you like, that God loves one chosen people to the detriment of others. But it is at the same time, I mean, he, it's not saying that he, uh, well, so it comes pretty close because he, he, he does say here that their wickedness is innate so that you almost get the impression that, that there was never any hope for them. But I think on the whole, the contribution of the wisdom of Solomon is the affirmation of natural theology the affirmation that you can know God through nature, that it doesn't depend on special uh, revelation. Pagans could, in principle, come to a knowledge of God. So this book then became very important for medieval theology later on. Any question or comment on any of that? Professor Collins, I wonder... Um is there any kind of uh, correlation between uh, kind of Pharisaic theology and this book, um, and particularly with the debate that we find in the New Testaments alluded to between the Pharisees and the Sadducees? You know, I mean, very little relate. There is this much in common 
that uh, in the New Testament, the Pharisees and the Sadducees disagree on the subject of resurrection. So the Pharisees would have agreed more with the wisdom of Solomon. But I think their way of thinking about it would have been quite different. Uh, I don't think the Pharisees thought in terms of the immortality of the soul, for example. But at the same time, I mean, if you put that question to the author of the Wisdom of Solomon, I think the author would have sided with the Pharisees in that debate because it was important to him that there is a judgment of the dead. And I think it's the judgment of the dead that's the important change. You know, that's what changes the whole ball game. <laughs> and I think that we'll do this, uh, get on to this on, on Wednesday, that where that first comes into the Jewish tradition is in the apocalyptic literature in the early second century BC. And you see, it changes the whole premises of life. If you don't think there is a judgment of the dead, then your hope is to live long in the land and see your children and your children's children. If you think that the goal of life is to live forever with the angels, oh, that's a whole different ballgame. And it, it changes the, the moral implications. Anything else? On Wednesday, you know, have a, have a look. You should at least read through the, the first six chapters or so of Daniel. I will talk a little bit briefly probably about Daniel chapter 2. Uh, but then I also want to read, talk a bit about the first book of Maccabees, chapters 1 and 2, and second book of Maccabees, chapters 4 and 5. Uh, these are important for the historical background. And then, as time permits, we will begin to look at Daniel 7 to 12, looking first probably at chapters 10 to 12. And then I'll continue more with the apocalyptic literature on Monday. Professor, can you um, please repeat those chapters from Daniel and Maccabees? Okay. Uh, for Daniel... You know, you can skim through chapters one through six. Uh, read more carefully chapters 10 to 12 for next day. But also read first Maccabees, first two chapters, one and two, and second Maccabees, chapters four and five. Glad to see that the cat stayed the course. Professor Colleen, yes. I have a question. Yes. Uh, I want to ask, um, um, is the wisdom of Solomon, uh, is, right, is written quite late after the Platonic school uh, have appeared? So yes. that it's different from the pre-Platonic thought that the, Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew thought of like immortality is the um, succession of um, your descendants. Yes. So, so that is like very ancient, pure thought of immortality is about having your descendants. But right. after that, after that, in the Old Testament, um, there's another kind of thought is influenced by the Platonic thought that the soul is immortal in itself. No matter, it's, it's not about judgment. It's just after the um, perish of your body. body and the soul just exists forever. That this is Platonic suggestion. Yes. And so um, when the Bible respond with this kind of thought, their <laughs> their change is the adaptation is um, in New Testament. I am not very sure here. It's like in the Wisdom of Solomon. Um, Wisdom of Solomon suggests that. Um, some like saved soul um, will not perish, just the not saved yeah. soul perish. Yeah. So this is what the wisdom of Solomon say. And then in New Testament, um, New Testament suggests that the restoration of the saved soul are both spiritual and the uh, body and body. Like so, is 
both yeah. were threats. You know, for, for the, the New Testament will be much more directly influenced by the apocalyptic literature, such as we find in the book of Daniel, which we will talk, get to now next day. Okay. That's much more influential in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So the immortality of the soul is you get in Hellenistic Judaism, in Philo and the Wisdom of Solomon, and then that idea is picked up in early Christianity, but it's picked up largely in Alexandria, again, you know, where people had some exposure to Hellenistic philosophy. The only book of the New Testament that comes close to that, I think, is the Gospel of John. You know, where you already pass from death to life. And even that, I think, is a little bit different. So we'll have more opportunity to talk about resurrection uh, when we get to the book of Daniel okay. now next time. Thank you. Thank you for that, Okay. Have a good couple of days and see you on Wednesday.